And now for the new and improved good quality stereo to mono audio amp that can put out a lot of power, is very easy to understand and assemble, and uses only cheap, readily available parts that you're going to have laying around on your shelf anyway. This is ideal for testing a speaker or for testing anything that generates audio. So here's the new circuit. We'll use a dual-sided power supply just like before. I'm using plus and minus 12 volts for a total of 24 volts. This time we have two signals, the left and right stereo channel. You could extend this to any number of channels and they will collapse down just the same. This is going to take both channels and combine them into a single signal, stereo to mono, and you could combine any number of channels down to mono. Now one thing I did is added pull down resistors on both of the signals. This means that you can plug and unplug your signal source while the audio is playing, while the amplifier is on, and you're not going to get that crazy popping noise as an ungrounded signal is surging through the thing. But also, if you have a mono signal, if only one of these channels is connected in the first place, then the other channel is just going to be zero instead of floating. So if you plug in one channel, it's still going to work. So this is a standard non-inverting summing op amp amplifier. Say that three times fast. The idea of a summing amplifier is that each signal source has a resistor on it, and the sizes of the resistors can actually change how much one voltage matters. It's weighted. So you could have this voltage count twice as much as this voltage, but I'm just doing it with equal sized resistors, so that way they're weighted equally, because I don't actually want to emphasize one channel over the other. You could do that if you had some sort of fade control, but this is just to amplify. This is not a fancy stereo control system. So they go through these equal value resistors into the non-inverting input. And the pull-down resistors and these resistors are all the same size. Now what really matters is the pull-down resistors are the same size, and these two resistors are the same size, so that the parallel resistance works out to be the same. It doesn't matter what it is, you know, as long as you, you need some resistance to make sure that the signal isn't draining into ground too much and the signal isn't draining from one to the other too much. This is supposed to be a high impedance input, but as long as one side and the other are the same resistance, whatever it is, then it will sum to be equal weights. So the pull down resistors don't interfere here. So that's the signal input. I have a potentiometer for gain control just like before, but this is a non-inverting amplifier. The previous version was inverting, which meant that the volume went all the way to zero and all the way up to the rails. A non-inverting amplifier with an op amp cannot go below unity gain. You cannot reduce the gain, you can only increase it or have it be a signal reproducer, copy and paste. That's okay in this case. In a, in a professional stereo system, you'd want to do it so that you can turn the volume all the way down. But in this case, with the signal amplified to its original level, you have to put your ear up to the speaker to even hear it, and that's what the good speaker, the crappy speaker, can't even reproduce it. Because the signal's gonna be less than two volts peak to peak, maybe less than one volt peak to peak. So it doesn't matter for this. So just like before, I have the push-pull transistors. In the current version, I have reduced these resistors to only 100 ohms. Oh, I guess I should mention, I think I'm using something like 22k ohms. It doesn't matter, it's just big, but not absurdly big. So 22k ohm seemed right, just somewhere in there. I'd, I'd say 10k or more, like between 10k and 50k. It, just try it out. I'm kind of spitballing, but anyway, those are bigger ones. But these I reduced to 100 ohms each, because I've still got the 8 NPNs and 8 PNPs in parallel. I won't put it up here again. Look at the previous video for the parallel, but it's just, it's just copy-paste. So the op amp, just like before, drives the bases together. The output is connected to the load, directly to the speaker, no transformers or anything in between, and still no capacitors. So once again, if you have a DC bias on your input signal, it will be amplified along with the signal, but you generally shouldn't have that. This output is fed back into the inverting input, but that's where the gain control is. So we have the potentiometer, the output goes through that, the other side of the potentiometer is grounded, and then the wiper, with lots of squeaking, goes to the inverting input. So if the potentiometer is turned all the way so that the wiper is shorted to the signal, all the resistance is between the wiper and ground, then what you have is what I just drew. You have the output directly connected to the inverting input, which is going to cause, if the non-inverting input has three volts on it, it's going to put out three volts, 
because three volts will come in through here and it'll be satisfied. So that's the unit again. And as you turn the potentiometer the other way towards ground, it begins to voltage divide between the signal and ground, so it cuts the amplitude of the output signal. So this has to increase the output signal so that it satisfies its condition of non-inverting minus inverting equals zero. And then if you turn it all the way down, or even close to all the way down, it's going to slam against the rails because, hypothetically, it's infinite gain. So you can't turn the knob all the way. If you turn the knob all the way, it'll just start distorting. But there's your gain control, so it'll be normal volume or higher. And then one more thing, I also have a pull-down resistor on the output that the load is connected to. And this is so that you can connect and disconnect your speakers and there's no surges. So if you don't have a load, it's going to see the pull-down resistor as the load, basically. So the amplifier will just keep going. And then as you plug in the load, it's not going to crackle and pop. I assume you would turn down the volume anyway, but if you don't turn down the volume, it's not going to crackle and pop because the signal is always, the output signal is always going to be feeding this grounded load no matter what the actual load is. And other than the parallel transistors, which is just here, this whole thing, and it's just copy, paste, 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 paste. That's all that is. Other than that, here's the whole circuit. So the changes from last time is it's stereo to mono instead of reproducing only one channel. It has pull down resistors on the input and output to make sure everything doesn't pop if you connect and disconnect it live. I'm only using one op amp, which is no different because I have two on the chip, so half the chip is just not getting used. But if you have single op amp chips, then there you go, you need only one. And the gain cannot go below the input signal. But I've chosen to not worry about it because it's mostly for testing, and I don't care if it's very, very quiet. So there you go. Removed an op amp, added some resistors, and we're all good. And it sounds even better. Not perfect. It's not going to sound perfect. This is why perfect audio equipment costs thousands of dollars, but it sounds plenty good enough. Once again, I'll show you the board afterward. This time I took pictures, so it'll be easier to show you than try and hold it up to the camera. Using my tablet for audio just like before. Beautiful. I'm going to use the same three speakers too. So the power supply is set to 12 volts and currently nothing is connected. So I will connect the audio source and you will notice that the only thing going through my breadboard now is the power. I have I wrapped it in tin foil a little bit to act as a Faraday cage, but mostly just to keep the wires together because there's less interference if the wires are together because the, the interference kind of affects all the wires the same. This is like using a twisted pair. If the wires are close together in parallel and a wave goes through them to induct, it'll induct into all of them equally and the difference between them will still be about the same. So it'll be less distorted. And the signal wires I actually twisted a a little bit to help there. So if I hit play, it again is not making noise because it detects that the headphones are plugged in. There's no load. If I turn up the gain, you'll see very little happen, but if I turn it all the way to the rails, you'll see a teeny tiny bit. See, because nothing's connected, the speaker's not connected, but the load is the pull-down resistor. So it is working. My only sadness with this board is I put the volume knob on backwards. I actually have to turn it up to turn the volume down. It's a small mistake. But anyway, let's go ahead and connect a speaker. And now the volume's all the way down, so it's at unity gain. And it is making some noise, It's because I've got the tablet on max volume. So you should be able to hear it, hopefully. Perhaps. But if I turn up the gain, which means turn the volume knob down, then the volume begins to increase. And now you should definitely be able to hear it. So if I go all the way up, you'll, if you watch your amplitude, you can tell when you're distorting, even if you can't hear the distortion, because the current goes weird. See, like that. If you look at the power supply, it keeps wanting to current limit. So you gotta turn it down and turn it down a little bit more. When you hit the rails, it just draws crazy power. Let me rewind. So this dinky, terrible little speaker No distortion, pretty good volume too, because it's getting a lot more volume to the speaker without distortion. Partly because I reduced the resistors to 100 ohms each. 
So let me go ahead and turn it back down, and then I will disconnect that speaker. Let's go to the computer speaker. If we connect this one, once again, you might be able to hear there is some sound at unit of gain, but if I turn the gain up, it very quickly becomes a serviceable volume. And if I turn it up, you can hear it's getting a little staticky. It, again, it's not perfect. It's not a perfect speaker. It's not a perfect reproduction, but it's very good. But if you look at the current, it's I'm near the distortion. I'm actually very near the distortion. I don't know if you saw the power supply flicker, but it's pretty good. It's putting out a lot of volume. But now for the real test, the actual quality speaker, my good old center speaker from my stereo system from so long ago. So I'll go ahead and connect that line and this line. And now you can really hear it. This is unity gain. You can definitely hear that. I would presume. I might not have gotten close enough. Because this is such a quality speaker. Let's rewind again. This is such a quality speaker. It actually is a higher ohm speaker than this one. This one's 8 ohms, that one's 4 ohms, but this one listed as 40 watts. And yet, it does more with less. So let's start turning the gain up. Listen to that quality. Let's have some more. How about this? It's so good. Look at how little power it's drawing, too. I'm not even close to distortion now. I don't want to actually turn it up too much because it's going to blast the neighbors. But you can tell, and it hasn't crackled one single time. I cannot even get into the distortion range without blowing the neighbor's ears out, and I don't want to do that. So I count this as a success. And just to demonstrate the pull-down resistors on the inputs, if I pull the input source out unceremoniously, nothing. Not a single pop or crackle. Let me go ahead and plug it back in, hit play once more, and let me unceremoniously disconnect the speaker. No crackling at all. What if I disconnect the ground line from the speaker instead? Nothing. That is the power of pull-down resistors. It sounds good. It can drive any speaker in your house. It uses parts that are rotting on your shelf doing nothing anyway. And the best part of all is this new circuit board. I decided to just solder it on without even testing it. I didn't even test it in my breadboard. I just did it. And I was clenching hard when I turned it on the first time. And it just worked. I'm genuinely just proud of myself that I did it straight up on the proto board with my soldering iron and the circuit in my head. That said, if I had tested the circuit, at first, I wouldn't have got the volume knob backwards, would I? So now I'm going to send you over to my computer where I'm going to go over how I made the board using some very nice pictures. So here's an overhead view of the board. I'm using screw terminals to connect everything, and I contemplated having them separated on the board just to make things a little more, well, separate. But it turned out to be not really an issue at all. And this is much easier. I've got the positive, negative, and ground power coming in. I've got the left, right, and ground signal coming in. And I've got the single speaker, which doesn't have a polarity, but, you know, one wire is essentially the neutral and the other is the hot. So it's just hooked up by screw terminals and there's the volume knob. And the only thing that goes to the breadboard is the power. So the close-up view of the top of the board, I've got the first terminal is positive power, which is jumpered all the way up. Here's, here's my NPNs, 100 ohm resistors, 100 ohm resistors, and PNPs. So the positive power comes up to the collectors of the NPNs. The second pin is the negative power, which goes up to the collectors of the PNPs. And then underneath the board, you can kind of see the wire. Oh, that's right, I've got it here. I've got the positive power and negative power jumpered over to power the op amp. The third, fourth, and fifth terminals are all ground. So it doesn't really matter which one's hooked in, but I've got the power ground here, the signal ground here, and the speaker ground here. So here's the three terminals, all three 
tied together for ground. And over here's my volume knob. I've soldered it to the to the little pads. You can see these pads here are down here as well. I just soldered it to these pads for, you know, to hold it down. And then ground is jumpered over to one side of the volume knob. Unfortunately, the wrong side. I have this on backwards. When you turn the volume knob all the way down, for this particular knob, it's going to short the wiper and this terminal. And that terminal is the one that's grounded, the outer one. When you turn the volume knob all the way down, you want to be at unity gain, which means the wiper and the signal should be shorted together. So turning it all the way down, it should be the middle and the outer wiper are connected together, or shorted together when the volume's all the way down. But unfortunately, I have the ground connected to the outer pin. The inner pin has the signal, which means I have to turn the volume up to short the, the wiper to the signal. But you know, just flip it, it'll be fine. Fortunately, that was my only mistake. So other than the three ground pins, the only other place the ground is, is on the potentiometer. Nothing else in the circuit even uses ground. So that's cool. So then the next to last two, these two are the signal. And then this one is the speaker hot. So these are the three pull down resistors. I guess that uses ground. So I've got the three of them all in this line here. So the three pull down resistors there, and then the two for the summing amplifier, which jump her over to the non-inverting input, and it gets a little messy here, since I didn't have actual traces to work with, but this doesn't cause any significant capacitance issues. So the output is taken from the middle of the resistors, which is here, and that is jumpered over the actual speaker output here, and then it's run over to the potentiometer, the volume knobs. You've got ground and you've got the output signal that the speaker's getting, voltage divided, here jumpered to the inverting input. And that's it. Such an incredibly simple board. I converted almost everything to solder bridges because it was a little easier. It's not like solder is expensive. But anyway, that's it. So I consider this design finished for this purpose, for a mono or stereo signal that's just getting amplified to power a speaker. So I can test a speaker, or I can test anything that generates sound. So this is my essentially permanent test board. And it would have probably been easier to solder wires on, but this way, because I've got plenty of screw terminals, so it'll take a little more time to set it up, but I won't lose my wires. So for creating a real amplifier for like a real stereo system, I would obviously use a better circuit than this. This is for ease of use, ease of making. Simple, you can, if one of these parts goes bad, you just, you know, cut the legs off, pull the thing out, and put a new one in. It's so easy. It doesn't even matter which transistors. You could replace them with different kinds. This just has to be NPN. This just has to be PNP. It doesn't even matter. Mix and match transistors and everything. It's so easy. Anyway, my work with amplifiers is by no means done. I've got a lot of stuff to explore. But for a simple around the house test amplifier, this is it. And if you're designing this and you wanted to have more channels, like you wanted to test a 5.1 system, who knows? All you have to do is add more signal wires. You just have an equal, you need the same value pull down and the same value across, and you short all of them to the non-inverting input. As many as you want, don't do 50, but as many as you want, and they'll all just be weighted equally. So I hope you like it, especially my fun little chromosome-shaped solder bridge here. It's a real work of art. So while I submit that to a New York gallery, I'll be seeing you.